Okay, hi, I'm Akshay, um, and this is Frank. We're uh, both from MIT, and we've been working on a new way to write congestion control algorithms, which I'm going to tell you about right now. So this is basically uh, how applications send data to the network today. So congestion control, as we just heard about, is a fundamental problem in networking. The question it answers is, when should we send the next packet? So historically, a natural place to implement congestion control is in the transport layer. And the two remain pretty tightly interwoven today. So you have your application, and you send your data to TCP. And completely transparent to you, TCP is running some congestion control algorithm, whether it's BBR or Cubic or, or PCC Vivace. And uh, that's how uh, it decides when to send your data to the network. However, this architecture where you tie uh, congestion control to the data path has three major shortcomings. First, uh, TCP is no longer the only data path, uh, where I mean uh, the network API by which the application sends data to the network. Uh, I'm not just referencing software data paths like Quick, but also new hardware accelerated data paths uh, created to aid CPUs in sending packets onto the wire as uh, network line rates have, have uh, scaled. And second, while data paths have been getting faster, congestion control algorithms have been getting more and more sophisticated. It's always been an active area of development. And uh, by the way, the timeline on this slide is approximate and not to scale. Uh, but algorithms proposed in the last few years use increasingly complex methods to detect the link capacity or cross-traffic characteristics and adapt their sending rates appropriately. So we have uh, you know, Sprout and Remy from uh, more than five years ago, or about five years ago, where they use uh, Bayesian forecasting and offline learning. And then PCC, which uses online learning. Indigo um, from this year, which uses reinforcement learning, which is trained on, on the Pantheon data set. And uh, our own work at MIT, which is, um, uses uh, signal processing techniques to detect and respond to cross-traffic characteristics. And basically what this explosion of development and congestion control leads to is what I'd like to call the cross product of sadness. So uh, you have a congestion control developer who must, must learn the ins and outs of each data path, like how, how pacing works, the ins and outs of uh, queue disks and the various layers of queuing and how they interact with each other to successfully implement their algorithm. Uh, then a new data path comes along written uh, for different trade-offs or a different uh, type of uh, implementation. And and you have to start all over again. You have to learn the quirks of the new data path and so on and implement your algorithm there. So for example, the BBR implementation on Quick was started after the Linux implementation was already stable, and yet it took several months to complete. And similarly, we just heard uh, how the PCC Vivace implementation, uh, they had some problems uh, moving between the two data paths that they were using. And finally, the third problem is that tying congestion control to the data path makes evolving new capabilities difficult. So there's a really old proposal called the congestion manager, where you uh, do per user congestion control instead of per flow congestion control and uh, manage congestion control across multiple flows at the same time. And this is pretty hard to implement in Linux. Um, and uh, basically required application changes in order to implement. So to summarize, this is what congestion control looks like today. The application sends data to the data path. And as the data, data path receives feedback from the network, it maintains statistics and exposes them via a custom API. For example, in Linux, this is the pluggable TCP API. What we're proposing is that the data path, that we should uh, encapsulate congestion control in a separate component and decouple algorithm uh, sophistication from the complexity of the data path. We call this new architecture the congestion control plane, or CCP. The application here is in a separate process from the CCP agent, and congestion control is moved out of the kernel or out of the data path and into user space. There are uh, several advantages of this design. So the first is that Congestion control algorithm code is now in user space, and we heard earlier from uh, the Quick folks how useful this is for them, and, and uh, there are similar, uh, like we're making similar arguments in that respect. Second is what we call write once, run anywhere. So the same implementation of a congestion control algorithm can interface with multiple data pads um, and run congestion control. And finally, this new architecture uh, enables new capabilities, such as the congestion manager, to be added pretty easily.
However, this comes with an obvious trade-off. There's now latency involved with uh, receiving information from and sending enforcement decisions to the data path. And uh, we solve the problem in the pretty standard way of batching information. So it's pretty reasonable to ex expect uncompromised performance because congestion control is now happening asynchronously. So communication or congestion control decisions might happen maybe once or twice per RTT and not upon every packet. And fortunately, once or twice per RTT happens to be a pretty natural time scale for congestion control since once you send a packet, it takes one RTT uh, to figure out what happened to it. And before I show you some evaluation uh, results, I'm, I'll like, let Frank do a quick demo of our implementation. Okay, so uh, just, yeah, I just wanted to give you a quick demo of our prototype of CCP we have running. So uh, just for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to show you our implementation of BBR. Um, what was that? Oh, great. Thank you. Oh, terminal font larger? Yeah, sure. Okay. Is that better? A little larger? Okay. Um, okay. So BBR has uh, a number of phases and the implementation details are pretty complicated, but just for those of you who aren't familiar with uh, even the high level, just to give you an overview of what to expect here. Um, uh, it spends most of its time uh, in a phase called probe bandwidth, which does uh, exactly as it sounds. It's probing for more bandwidth and it, it does this by oscillating about a target rate between three fourths and uh, five fourths of that target rate. Uh, and then periodically it'll go into a probe RTT phase where it um, drains the queues, uh, cuts its rates to drain the queues uh, and get a better estimate of the min RTT and then it'll ramp back up. So I just want to show you um, what uh, the kernel implementation looks like and then we'll compare that with uh, how our implementation looks. So um, we have uh, an emulator here. Uh, give me one sec. And uh, I have a little visual visualization here of the uh, throughput and delay on the bottom. And what I'm going to do is just run uh, a single um, BBR flow using iperf uh, and show you what the throughput and delay look like over time. Uh, and the bottleneck link characteristics are on the bottom there, 48 Mbps, 50 milliseconds RTT, and one BDP of buffering. Um, let's see. All right, so the animation's a, a little jagged, but um, just to, to give you an idea, so you can see that the uh, in the blue line there, that's the delay. You can see it uh, oscillating about that target rate. Um, and then that periodic drop right there was the probe RTT phase. Um, and so this just gives you a, a general idea of what the kernel implementation looks like now in the very simple case of a single flow. Um, and then, so now I'm going to show you what uh, it looks like when you run with CCP. All right, uh, so in addition to uh, you know, getting everything set up, we have this uh, additional step simply of uh, running our uh, user space module. So uh, I have this all compiled and everything already, but um, basically, as Akshay is going to describe in more detail later, we have um, a user space library implemented in Rust, and all you have to do to implement your algorithm is uh, import our library and uh, add your functionality. Um, and so I've compiled it already, so I'm going to run that here. And then we'll start iperf again, but this time we'll tell it to use uh, CCP instead of BBR. Let's make sure this is ready. Okay. Get the receiver. Okay. Uh, it's uh, a little delayed, but um, so we haven't implemented the startup phase, so it goes through a little bit of a slow startup. But uh, now you can see that it's doing about the about the same behavior. So we're oscillating about that target rate, uh, and then there you see that uh, the probe RTT drop. So again, I'll emphasize that this is a very like, simple implementation of the high-level details of, um, of PBR, but this just kind of shows the capabilities um, and expressiveness of uh, CCP. So I'll hand it uh, back over to Akshay to go through uh, more of the details of how that API works. <laughs> 
Great. So uh, we just saw the live results for BBR, and this is Cubic, uh, the CCP implementation and the kernel implementation on the same axes. You can see that the CCP implementation matches the dynamics of what the kernel does uh, pretty closely. In terms of performance, uh, this experiment was you run uh, a, like local host connections uh, with increasingly parallel uh, number of flows, and the CCP implementations are configurable, so you can decide if you want to that you're going to make a decision upon every hack and get get feedback sent to user space and do the context switch and make a decision and send uh, your enforcement decision back. Or you can decide that uh, you're going to make a decision only every, say, 10 milliseconds or so. And you can see that there is, you get closer to what the kernel does um, when you make decisions, uh, when you avoid context switches, uh, context switches by making decisions less frequently. And what I think are the most exciting results are what we called write once run anywhere. So these results hold across data paths. So this is the same code for two different algorithms. On the bottom is Cubic, and on the top is COPA, which is a new delay-based algorithm which was proposed at NSDI this year. And you can see that um, on the left, the Two algorithms run on in the kernel, and then in the middle on Quick, and then on the right on MTCP, which is uh, a, a DPDK-based TCP implementation. And the dynamics of congestion control, uh, congestion window evolution, match across all three data paths. So. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to discuss CCP's congestion control API, or at least our proposed version of what the API should be. Uh, we need to support this asynchronous operation without compri uh, compromising on either algorithm correctness or performance. Because each packet contains valuable information, we have to gather measurements per packet, but we still want to make most congestion control decisions asynchronously. So we split algorithm implementations into two components. There's a slow path component, which has access to user space libraries, runs in user space, but operates asynchronously, and a data path or fast path component, which has a constrained API, but op operates synchronously upon every uh, feedback that is received. So first, I'll overview the API for this asynchronous component. Uh, as we saw earlier in the diagram, we have referred to this component as the CCP agent. It provides a runtime and API, uh, which algorithm developers use to specify the behavior of a congestion control algorithm. Our implementation is written in Rust and exposes Python bindings, so I'll use the uh, Python syntax to explain um, the API. So. There are two event handlers that you have to implement. One is on create, which is what should you do when a new flow arrives, and on report, which is what should you do when the data path sends you some new measurements to work with. So I'll walk through an example on report function, which implements a congestion avoidance mode. So this code runs in the context of the CCP agent. So first, one thing that you might want to do is take the information that you're given, uh, so the number of packets that were act, and perform this additive increase update to your congestion window. And next, you can tell the data path to update the congestion window uh, that you just decided to use. Okay. Uh, for the data path component, there, there are two parts to it. So the first interacts with the data, pack, uh, data path. Um, so in the case of the kernel, we use the pluggable TCP API to get access to the state that we need to uh, collect measurements and enforce decisions. We also provide an execution environment for what we call data path programs, which are the synchronous component of a CCP algorithm. The data path includes a component called libccp, which interprets these data path programs to uh, produce these uh, enforcement decisions and measurements. So this second part, which the red arrow is pointing to, is portable across data paths. So we took the same code and we use it inside the Linux TCP data path, inside Quick, and inside uh, MTCP. And the way you define a data path program is in user space. You define it using a domain-specific language, which we wrote. Uh, the language has a pretty straightforward, simple syntax and uh, is probably more restrictive than uh, Developing, so you can't. Uh, you can do simple arithmetic computations, uh, and it's intended to merely gather information from the data path and report it. So these programs uh, are sent down um, to the data path using uh, IPC, and we currently use Netlink, but uh, you can imagine using other things as well. So for Quick, we use Unix domain sockets. Uh, 
So there are a number of predefined variables that the program can access. These correspond directly to congestion control state stored in the data path's flow context and exposed to the data path program by the shim layer uh, that runs inside the data path. So this example program uh, on the first line defines a report structure. And inside that report structure, uh, a variable called act, which is the number of uh, consecutively act packets that we, uh, that we saw. And uh, on the first clause, the, the when true, that says that this event handler should fire every time that the, we got more feedback. And when we do get more feedback, we increment this act counter by the number of cumul uh, cumul cumulatively uh, act packets. And in the last two clauses, we see that when there, when an RTT has elapsed or we saw some lost packets, we should send this predefined report structure uh, to the CCP agent in user space. Uh, the data path program can also do some pretty simple modification to the enforcement. So you can set the C win. So for example, here we did a one line addition in our when true clause and implemented slow start. So it's not just act.bytesact. This is the full list of congestion control signals that we support for use in data path programs and a description of how we define them in terms of the Linux TCP data path. We, we view this list as sort of an evolving standard, but I'd like to point out that new congestion control signals don't come along that often. And all of these, except for the last two, uh, were in uh, Linux for a really long time. And the last two are, are now in NetNext as of two days ago. So moving forward, we'd like to see CCP distributed as an in-tree kernel module once we figure out uh, some minor issues we've had with hardening it for scale. Uh, we're more than happy to work with uh, CC, uh, congestion control algorithm developers to implement their algorithms using our library. Uh, our current data path component implementations, which uh, we saw were used to generate the graphs on this in this talk, they're all on GitHub, uh, as is the CCP agent and a few algorithm implementations. We've currently implemented Cubic, Reno, BBR, Copa, and, and uh, Nimbus, which is our own. Uh, one caveat is the quick data path implementation. We're not sure how to distribute our patch um, without hosting all of Chromium ourselves. Um, and I'm happy to talk to people about how to, the best way to distribute that afterwards. Uh, thanks, and uh, happy to take questions. Questions? So, hi. Thank you for the talk. Uh, mm -hmm. When you were talking about the, the good put as you increase the number of flows, what was the RTT for those flows? This is a local host connection, so the RTT is basically zero. OK. Thanks. So when we, when we run it on a, a testbed cluster of 10G and measure CPU utilization, we find that the context switch overhead was a, maybe about 5 to 8% of extra CPU utilization. So how much was the CPU overhead? Sorry? How much was the CPU overhead? Like 5 to 8%. 5 to 8%? Yeah. OK. And I think people have already mentioned to you that you could also use uh, BPF to have better yes. performance and to be able to explain Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great point. I actually have uh, an extra slide for this. So we diverge from eBPF on, in, in two fronts. So the front end, which is the language, and the, and the back end on the, the data path. So I think the, the data path part is, is the more important part. So uh, we, when we looked into eBPF, we found that doing congestion control enforcement, like setting pacing rates and, doing, and directly changing the congestion window was uh, a little bit hard. And more importantly, what we, we really cared about having the uh, data path component of CCP be portable across data paths. So we would have had to implement a BPF runtime in, you yes. know, in Quick and in MTCP and, and... No, no, no. I mean, you, you could extend the kernel to have that component, but rather than calling your user level program to, to make decisions, you would call it in BPF. So there would be much less overhead for that. Yeah, but then you lose the flexibility of running arbitrary, you're making arbitrary decisions in, in user space, right? You'd have to be restricted to what EBF can do, e yeah. EBPF can do. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, just Hi. a very quick question. Hi. Um, thank you for the nice presentation and demo, actually. Um, do you, is the only way how you manipulate the sending rate just the congestion window, or do you also have some kind of time-based pacing? 
whatever influence <laughs> mechanism. What do you mean by time-based pacing? Like, like the interface I would like is telling, just telling you when you should send out the next packet. Uh, yeah, so we currently haven't implemented this, but I'm happy to talk about how we could do that. I think that's important for future use cases. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, you can set, uh, like, SO pacing rate, uh, and you can do that, like, you can say, after five microseconds, I want SO pacing rate to be X, and after 10 microseconds, I want SO pacing rate to be Y, and so on. But uh, controlling exactly, like, you can't do, like, Poisson sending of packets. We don't support that yet. Eric, you can go next. Uh, please, you should take the... Um, okay. Um, um, so, uh, how frequent is the communication between the data and the control pass? Is it for every act you trigger an app call? This is configurable, so it depends on the implementation of the congestion control algorithm. But you can you can make it be whatever you want. Okay. So, like, can your implementation run on say on a forty Gbps NIC? What kind of throughput? So the fastest we've tested it is ten G. Uh, okay. We have we don't have access to a forty G NIC to test. Okay. So for a 10G, then what's the throughput you can reach? Yeah, so we're, we can saturate 10G. OK, yeah, that's very good. Um, and also in your last slides, uh, there is a cluster aggregation CCP. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Yeah, so this is the idea of the congestion manager. This is something that we haven't, uh, we're, we're like looking into now. We're, we're just starting to implement it. This is the idea of uh, performing congestion control operations on groups of flows together. Okay, like all the flows in inside the in the host. Yeah, inside a host or even in a cluster, and the congestion control is happening like remotely on another machine. Okay, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Is Eric next? Uh, Eric, you want to go or you're fine? Yeah, um, just to make sure that you are going to test um, the stuff with 10 million TCP active uh, flows because this is the, the target we are we have uh, on Google servers, uh, at least the GFE servers, mm. so, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, making it scale to, to millions of flows is, is something that we're working on right now. Um, thank you for the presentation. I actually really like the idea. Um, but I can't square away everything in my head, so I'll have to think about this a little bit longer because I, I, I feel like there are a lot of missing pieces. Uh, the presentation is obviously an overview, um, but there's also something um, that's not clear to me. Uh, a couple of things, actually. One, it's not clear to me how uh, the kernel TCP interacts with this with this model, what, with this module. What's the what is the API that you're using right now for kernel TCP to interact with this? Not the API, but the what what is the mechanism you're using? So we use so we implement support for kernel using the pluggable TCP API. The pluggable TCP API. So we write we wrote a kernel module which implements a, a pluggable TCP congestion control algorithm, which reads uh, various uh, like you know these fields in the TCP SOC structure and in the rates rate sample structure, and I exposes see. them to the to the data path program execution environment. I see. I think I thought um, Jenna's question might be how is the kernel part uh, up calling into user space to do the, um, the more yeah that that processing? also happens via IPC so we well, which we, kind of IPC so currently it's Netlink uh, I think we also have a character device implementation it's flexible um, one of the concerns maybe I actually touched on this earlier um, Ian talked about in in the quick presentation we talked we touched on basically why it's difficult for us to do pacing currently with the model uh, that FQ uses uh, in the system. Mm -hmm. So something like that is uh, uh, points. So the problem there is that in, in, in the kernel, TCP um, uh, FQ assumes that a socket is one connection, whereas with the, with the quick model, one socket can map to many connections. Something like that points to assumptions in the underlying model that something like FQ makes. Um, and that's what I'm trying to tease apart in my head. I'm yeah. trying to figure out what are the assumptions in the underlying model, in the underlying world of congestion control that you're making to arrive at this API. Right. Because I wonder if this API is going to be adequate for, um, for other congestion controllers. At the same time, I also wonder if what you have in there is going to be adequate for, uh, like you were pointing out, Quick as well as TCP. For now, just to finish my thought, if TCP uses FQ for pacing, uh, 
and Quick doesn't use FQ for pacing, I can't square away how your m module is going to be able to allow for both of those things to exist. Right. So, so the back end of, of how the enforcement happens and how the measurements are collected is going to be data path specific. So uh, in uh, the Linux kernel, we use uh, SO pacing rate. In Quick, we might use some other data path specific, Quick specific way of pacing. So like it, obviously, with different data paths, there are going to be different ways of doing enforcement. And we're going to need a shim layer per data path that that interprets the commands that that user space is sending into the data path and and carries out those enforcement in a in a data path specific way fair enough so you might have to end up implementing something like pacing yeah. as well inside of the controller yeah and, and i thing. think uh our, our quick data path our quick patch uh either uses something that's already in quick I'm, I'm not too familiar with it i'd have to check but i can get back to you just one thing to be wary of is that one of the nice things about having multiple implementations of a protocol is, of course, the standard uh, arguments apply that you can weed out bugs, you have multiple implementations, so there's no single point of failure. You will be creating one of those things when you have something like this, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but just something to be very aware of. Um, but I do like the idea quite a bit. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, actually, Jenna left out a cool story about the benefits of diversity of congestion control where the quick folks and when they re-implemented uh, Cubic, they found a, a bug that had been in there for a decade that caused it, uh, that was a very profound bug. And actually, once we, once those guys found it and we fixed it in the TCP and YouTube, we like cut the loss rate measure like visibly in mm -hmm. all of our graphs. So the, there's some cool benefits from diversity. Um, I, I, this is actually more of a minor point, but um, on the, uh, uh, the cool demo, by the way, and thanks for um, picking VBR. <laughs> um, uh, do you know what the pacing mechanism was on the um, machines that were, was it FQ pacing or the internal I pacing? I think the demo used in-stack pacing. In-stack pacing, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, w um, this is uh, definitely just a, a minor point, but uh, I would look, um, try to maybe uh, update to a more recent kernel or, or backport some fixes. We had some recent fixes um, that uh, affect the internal pacing behavior of BBR. I noticed in the demo, actually, the latency sort of went up and hovered around a high level. And with, I guess that was a single flow, right? Yeah, it's a single yeah, flow. Yeah, for a single flow, BBR is, should, is, is almost always good at sort of keeping the latency down around the, the two-way propagation delay. So um, I w I'll email you the patch to uh, uh, look at for fixing that. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, one more comment about uh, it would be nice for you to have a metric where you compare the behavior of the protocols when they are in kernel versus your implementation. Yeah, because I, you mentioned you are asynchronous, so you are comparing a good boot and a protocol could have the same good boot and just have like three times more losses, right? But but it may, yeah, it may not. It, it would be it would be great to talk about this offline. We we've we've, okay. we've thought about this a lot and we haven't really found a good metric for like a single, like something that we can condense down and say like this is the score for the fidelity of this implementation other than, other than looking at two graphs in parallel. But okay. it would be great to hear suggestions. Sure. Uh, it's not entirely clear to me what's the execution context for your data path programs. So that's something that you're, you're taking this lispy looking thing and compiling it to something that you're shoving in the kernel or maybe elsewhere yeah. as well. What, yeah. How does, can you explain a bit more how that works? Yeah, so I mean, we have like, you can kind of think of it as a, as a really high level virtual machine, kind of like uh, how eBPF works. So it's you know, compiled in user space into low, low, low level instructions, and those instructions are interpreted inside, uh, inside our data path component, libccp. So you've added yet another bytecode interpreter to the kernel? Sure, you can think of it that way. OK. It, is your intention to also put this other places for portability or? Yeah, so I mean, our our uh, implementation is portable, and like to implement support for Quick and MTCP, we took the same interpreter and and, uh, and linked it in there. So that's that's how we implemented this. Cool. Um, I forgot to ask one question. Um, I'm sure you thought about reusing existing implementations, uh, but I, clearly you did not do that in terms of the congestion controllers themselves. Did you actually try using, for example, the Linux or the quick BBR implementation instead of writing your own? Because that would, that if this was to go forward uh, as, as, as a library, I would much rather not have brand new implementations 
well actually let me not say that uh, i would i would want to consider reusing existing implementations as well as developing new ones yeah but um I'd be interested in seeing. Did you did you try that? What's your experience been? If not, would you consider trying that? Yeah, this is a fair question. I think one of the differences is that existing implementations, which are data path specific, tend to be written like synchronously. So y there is the expectation that you're able to make decisions upon every packet, whereas this new API is asynchronous. So we didn't consider uh, sort of attempting to use the code as is because the API is, is, is sort of running in a different context. You might you might look at the code. Uh, it might be easier to make it asynchronous in parts that you care about okay. than you than you imagine. Yeah. At least some of it. I can I can speak for the for the quick implementation because we have a pretty clean interface in Chromium mm -hmm. and uh, that interface does I again I try to think about this more but then I suspect you might be able to use that directly. Yeah, I think we're definitely willing to look into it. Any more questions? Oh, thanks. I really enjoyed this. Thank you.